Okay. Well, today I want to talk about uh, the other device that we can use to store energy. We've talked about the capacitor. Uh, we went through, we looked at how a capacitor was constructed, we looked at how a capacitor behaves at certain times. There were three important times, T equals zero, uh, the time when the capacitor is fully charged, and the time while the capacitor is charging. So we want to do something similar with this uh, other device called an inductor. I'll talk about the physical construction of an inductor. I'll uh, talk about the electrical properties, and um, we'll talk about some important times. I'm not going to spend as much time with the inductor as I did with the capacitor um, for several reasons. The, the, the main one is uh, often if you have a choice of using one over the other, in some, some applications you can use an inductor or a capacitor. And if you have a choice, typically you want to use the capacitor. The reason is, as you'll see, inductors have a magnetic field around them, and that magnetic field can actually cause problems in the circuit. So if you have a choice, let's just say when you have a choice of using one or the other, then typically people are going to want to use a, um, a capacitor because you don't have the noise problem. I'll go a little bit more into that. Um, but if you uh, sometimes you don't have a choice and you have to use an inductor, it depends on what the application is. So uh, let me start by going back to the capacitor. A capacitor is a device that stores energy. An inductor is exactly the same type of device. It stores energy. Uh, physically, they're different. Well, you know, a basic capacitor is, is two parallel plates, parallel plate capacitor, two conductors separated by an insulator. Uh, the energy is actually stored in the capacitor between the plates. We didn't talk a whole lot about that, but you do know there's an electric field that exists between the plates of a charged capacitor. That's where the energy is stored in the terms of in, 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 uh, is, as potential energy. We um, think of, we know that the device is storing energy, but we like to think of it in terms of charge. The more charge across the plates of the capacitor, the more voltage across the uh, capacitor. And so we can say that the capacitor is charged up. You can charge the capacitor, set it on the shelf, and go back and get that voltage or current later. What you're really getting later is the energy that's stored in the device. But the key is, is that with the capacitor, the energy is stored in the electric field that exists between the plates. So now I want to talk about the second object, the second uh, component that uh, allows us to store energy to use it at a later date. The name of it is an inductor, an inductor. And basically an inductor is nothing more than a piece of wire. So anytime you have two conductors separated by an insulator, you have a capacitor. Well, if you have a piece of wire, you have an inductor. A wire carrying current is an inductor. Now, usually what we do, we want to make an inductor. We don't have a straight wire. Usually what's done is they'll coil it. They'll coil of the conductor. They'll make it into a coil like this. And um, often in the coil, they will have what they call a core. They have a core, it's just kind of like a, a solid piece of iron, some kind of conductor, usually soft iron. But they'll have a core, and it's usually made out of iron. And then they'll take the coil which is insulated, and they'll wrap the coil around the core. And when we get, well, when we get to AC here, if you take AC with me, when we talk about devices like this, we'll talk about the importance of the core. I won't spend time on that uh, today, but we do go into some detail in AC because there's a device in AC called a transformer. It's basically just two inductors put together and they're wound around a common core. And I go into some detail of why, uh, what the purpose of the core and some of the properties and all of that. So if you take me for AC, we'll go into that. Um, but basically, just suffice it to say, an inductor is a piece of wire wrapped into a coil. And when you send the current through it, as you know, when you send a current through a conductor, all current carrying conductors have a magnetic field. We talked about the fact that if I have a coil, a hook of a battery to it, uh, I get a magnetic field that looks much like a, the magnetic field that you would find around a bar magnet. 
The thing is with electromagnetism, which is what we're talking about, I can control that because I can increase or decrease the current to the coil and I can basically indirectly increase or decrease the magnetic flux or the field, or I can reverse the polarity of the uh, voltage source connected to the coil and that will have the effect of switching the north and the south pole. So um, you're familiar with that already because we talked about it. But let's talk about this uh, idea of inductance. So I want to start by saying uh, the symbol we use for an inductor is a coil. Um, the, the, uh, the graphic symbol is a coil. The letter that represents inductance is an L. We talked about uh, C for capacitor. Well, for an inductor, it's an L, not an I, because we use I for current already, so we use an L. So, you know, we use C for capacitors or capacitance, and the unit for capacitance is the ferret. When we deal with inductors, we use the letter L to represent inductance, and the unit of inductance is a Henry, like the person's name Henry. So, so many Henrys of inductance. I have a formula, by the way, and you might probably didn't get a chance to see this, but right before I started the lecture, I put up on Blackboard the documents I'm going to use for today's lecture. There's three documents I put up there. If you have a chance to print them out, like you can print them out now, you can bring them up on your screen. You don't really need them because anything I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to put on the board. You can just take notes and kind of pay attention to what I'm doing. But if you like having these documents in front of you, go ahead and print them out You know, while I'm kind of talking and writing, you'll have them in front of you. If not, I just wanted to make sure you had a copy of what I would have passed out to you if we were meeting face to face. And you can add that to your uh, three ring binder. Now, when we talked about capacitors, I gave you two formulas. I gave you one that described the physical characteristics of the capacitor. You know that capacitance is directly proportional to the area of the plates and inversely proportional to the distance between the plates. Then I gave you uh, an electrical uh, formula that relates uh, capacitance, uh, relates uh, voltage, and relates charge, uh, C equals Q on B, and that's kind of our Ohm's law for capacitors. So I want to kind of follow the same format with inductors. So start by saying that inductor, basically just think of an inductor as a coil, and usually we wrap the coil around a piece of metal we call a core. Typically that core is made out of iron. The formula that describes the physical characteristics of the inductor, I have on the board. Now, if you have the handout that I put on Blackboard, or when you get it, you'll notice it's a little bit different. I don't have that K. I actually have a number there on the actual handout, and that number is a constant. And often when I show these equations, if it's just a constant, I'll just represent the constant as a, a lowercase k, just because it makes the uh, equation look a little bit simpler. But let me talk briefly about this, and I want to spend a little bit more time with this one. Here is the uh, formula that describes, that relates the physical parameters uh, of a inductor. And now here, here's the electrical equivalent of our C equals Q on B for capacitors. So this is the physical formula. This is the electrical formula. And this says that the L, the inductance, equals, that's the Greek letter mu, and there's an R, mu R. Uh, times n squared times a, and that's a lowercase l. And as I said before, that's a lowercase k, where it represents a constant. I have the number on the handout when you look at it. Well, you can write down in your notes. I won't write it on the board. And I'm actually not going to spend a whole lot of time with this on the top. I'm going to talk more about the one on the bottom. Um, this mu here is, that's called the relative permeability. The relative permeability uh, of the core material, relative permeability, that's, really, that's a constant, so any constants, uh, you know, we talked about the, uh, the, uh, the constant for the capacitor, it depends on what dielectric put in between the plates. Well, this constant here, once you, once you get an inductor, the, the number doesn't change. So um, to talk about K or mu, it's, it's really doesn't really do a lot of good to talk about that. Know the name is the relative permeability. What's more important though is the N, the A, and the and the L here. So remember I said that this coil is usually, not all the time, but it's usually wrapped around the core material. And think of the core as just like a solid pipe. 
a, a metal rod, a metal a piece of uh, uh, a solid pipe is the best thing I can describe it as. If you think of it like that, that pipe would have a a length would have a length so that distance right there. And what will happen is we will wrap this coil around this so that the length, this lowercase l, represents the length of the coil. I'm just putting it here next to the core because I'm thinking about an inductor whose uh, winding is wrapped around from one end of the core to the other. So this is the length of the coil or the core, either way you want to think about it. So this L is the length of the coil. This N, N, this capital N is the number of terms. Now we've talked about that when we talked about Faraday's law, which I want to revisit. So N is the number of terms on the coil. And A is the area of the core. So if this is the core then the A would be that. If you look, at, this is your eyeball, and you're looking at that, then you would see a circle, right? And so the area of that core would be the A here. And so you can see the relationship. Uh, the K is not important, and the mu is not important, but you can see the relationship between inductance and the number of terms. This is a big one, right? L is directly related, not to N, but L is directly related to N squared. So if you think about what that means, if I double the number of terms, if I double the number of terms that I have on the core, you might think that it would double the inductance. But since I have a square there, that means if I double the number of terms, I got to square that too. This will go up by a factor of four. So the inductance goes goes way up. So L is directly proportional to the to the square of the number of terms. Uh, L is directly proportional to the area of the core and inversely proportional to, to the length. So get that handout. On the handout, I actually have, uh, you know, I have a nice list. I have this formula. I give you the actual, the actual constant. Uh, and I have a nice list that names all of these and, and talks a little bit about what they are. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that one. But I do want to talk about the one on the bottom. So let me clean the board up. And then anytime you have a question, uh, you guys open up your mics and you can ask me as I go through this. Now let's talk about the equation on the bottom. Before we get to that, I know some of you have had calculus. Probably most of you have not. But I think everyone in here you're familiar with the term, and we talked about this already, but let me just remind you. Um, you're familiar with slope. Now, you know slope, if, you, if I say, well, what's the slope uh, of a line? And you say, that's rise over run. Most people say rise over run. But mathematically, what you would do to find the slope, you would, you would take a line and you take two points, say P2 and P1, and once you name that P2, then you got coordinates, X2, Y2, and X1, Y1. So once you name the points, you got the coordinates. And then what you mean by rise over run, you really, what you really mean is the slope is the change in Y over the change in X. They call this right here the rise, and they call that the run, right? But what does change in y over change in x, or how do you get those values? Well, I'm sure you remember from your algebra course, all you do here, you get the change in y, without going into too much mathematical detail, um, it's just the, the y2 minus y1. So delta y is defined as y2 minus y1 over, and x2 defined the same way, x2 minus x1. So for slope, I can write this form. I can write this formula right here. If you give me two points in the coordinates, I can put them into this form, and I can tell you what the slope is. But as you know, a shorthand way, instead of writing y2 minus y1, they just call that delta y, right? They call it delta y. But that represents a change in something. So, um, and I'll go more into this because you actually, 
when we uh, when we do AC, again, if you take me for AC, I teach it from a physics point of view, and as you know, physics is based heavily on calculus. So you don't have to know calculus at all. I'm not saying you, we got to know calculus. But what I do in AC is borrow some concepts from calculus to help uh, help, help help you understand the, the physical phenomena that we're talking about a little bit better. So I just we don't do any calculations with calculus, but we borrow some concepts, uh, one very close to this one from calculus. So that's what this is right here. So instead of writing this this way, this changing y over changing in calculus, they might say that the slope. Now the slope of a line in calculus, and I'm talking about, I'm going to put a little t here. That t stands for a tangent, a tangent. And this is, and we'll talk about that. If you if you take me for AC, we'll talk about it. If you take the other guy, you might talk about it. So you have to call me up on the phone or something if you want to know what a tangent is if you don't already know. But in, in calculus, what I can do is I can I can do a mathematical process of this called taking a limit. Don't worry about what that is. Well, it changes this into dy dx. And so basically, this is the slope of a line, and this is the slope of a line too, but it's a special line called a, a, a tangent line. And the big difference is, is that tangent line will tell us the slope at a point, whereas this tells us the slope over a whole range. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's like this. Like suppose I have a, a, a curve. And I want to know the slope right there. Well, how would I find the slope right there? Well, a tangent line is just basically a line that will, you just put it at that point like this. So if I put it at the point, so the line touches the curve at that one point. Now, if I take the slope of that, then I got the slope of the tangent line instead of the slope of just a regular, what you would call a regular line. Um, and then that's when you would use this dy, dx. So for now, just think of this. This delta y over delta x, we can think of these, and this is, if you're any mathematicians out there, you'll be mad at me for saying this. But for now, think of delta y over delta x and dy over dx as meaning the same thing. This means the uh, change in y over change in x, and this means the instantaneous change in y over instantaneous uh, change in x, or an infinitesimally, I like that word. Infinite means really big. Infinitesimally small. I like that. An infinitesimally small change in y over an infinitesimally small change in x. So for now, we're just going to say that these two are equal. Because what happens is, uh, I mean, a lot of people understand it this way, but my background, I want to write it like this. So if that bothers you, just uh, stick deltas in here for my d, and you'll have the same thing. So let me bring this equation up on the board a little bit and you can see what I'm talking about here. So I'll write it up a little higher. So it says that L equals VL over, and then I got this thing, D I D T like that. So that di dt, di dt, what I'm saying is for now, you can think of this as being the same as change in i over change in t. So a lot of books are writing like this, but if you take a calculus-based course, you'll see it like this. Same thing. But either way, if you think about it, you can think of both of those as ratios, and you can see if these are ratios, that current is going to be in amps, and time is always in seconds. So this right here, the delta y, delta i over delta t is amps per second. Remember in the last lecture, I think it was the last lecture, I said that when you have, we talk about a rate of change, if you have a t on the bottom, it's a time rate of change. So we said that power excuse me, it's change in energy over change in time. This will be in joules in that second, so many joules per second. In physics, a time rate of change is really important. I mean, in physics, if you talk about the distance divided by the time, or I should say displacement, I don't want to be strictly speaking, but if I take a break, the distance or displacement 
There's a difference. I know there is. I'm using them as if they're the same. But if you take the distance divided by the time, that might be miles, that might be uh, meters per second, or it might be miles per hour. Again, that's a time rate of change. So in physics uh, and engineering, a time rate of change is important. You'll see a T on the bottom of a, of a ratio often. And that's a, that represents some kind of change, some kind of motion. Something's changing. And so this will be an answer per second. But this too, DI, just think of the, the delta and the D is the same. I still have I over T, so this is still an ounce per second. So the more ounce per second, the more ounce per second I have, that means the faster that current is changing. And so what this says is that, let me give you some definitions over here. DL would be the voltage across DL. That's the voltage across the coil, the inductor. So VL is the voltage across the inductor. What is di dt? Again, delta i over dt. Well, that's the change in current. The change in current. And so it says that this, this inductance, this ability to uh, store energy in the magnetic field, this inductance is related to V and how fast we change the current. So the usually V is set. Usually I, I think of that, I take a snapshot of it. And I just look at a fixed V. But this di dt, or delta i delta t, I can change the current as fast as I want. And the faster I change the current, the more inductance I, I would have um, in, in the circuit. Now, let me go back a little bit, because I think I got a little ahead of myself. I want, let's talk about energy storage. Both the capacitor and the inductor store energy as potential energy. With a capacitor, you have a, two, two plates. Now, there's many types of capacitors, but we talked about a basic parallel plate capacitor, which is when you start learning, that's where you start. Okay, so if I got two plates and I charge them up, in between those two plates is an electric field. And, and, and you know, we talked about fields on the second week of class. We said fields can carry energy and fields can, can carry force or can cause a force. We talked about that. Well, here's a case where I have a static field, and it's got a whole energy. And as I build up charge on those two plates, positive on the top, negative on the bottom maybe, the electric field intensifies. And then when I take the capacitor out of the circuit, I basically have a separation of charge because I have a dielectric in the middle. They, they can't get together. Basically, I have a separation of charge, and you know that is voltage. But the point I'm making is in the battery, the energy is stored in the electrochemistry that makes up the battery. Here, the energy is stored in the electric field between the plates for a capacitor. And it's stored as potential energy. If I want to get the energy out, I hook something to it, I discharge the circuit, I can, I can get the energy out of the capacitor. Well, where then is the energy stored in, and if I have an inductor? Where is it stored? Well, I want to go back to... Uh, I think it was last time we were together. We talked about Faraday's law. And I told you we would come back. That is one of the most important laws that you can learn when you're trying to learn this stuff, in my opinion. Faraday says that if I want to induce, again, the word induce, if I want to induce a voltage, this is Faraday, If I want to induce a voltage, I got to have three things. I got to have a conductor or coil. Remember we said in that uh, discussion that we have a, a, we have a conductor, but well, usually we coil it up. When I showed you motor action, I showed you generator action, I showed you a coil. So a coil, a coil basically that's an inductor. A coil is an inductor. So Faraday says if I have an inductor, if I have a magnetic field, that's still not enough. I gotta have one more thing. I gotta have movement. I gotta have motion. I gotta have change. I put motion here, but how you represent motion or change mathematically, you do it with a time rate of change by putting a T in the denominator of whatever it is you're changing. This would just be, be current, but this is current per unit time, amps per second, and so forth. 
that represents change. Now, if you study Faraday's law, it, it, it's really interesting because let me show you how we wrote that. I don't know if you remember, because I remember that now. I was trying to get you guys to watch that video and the uh, this Blackboard collaborate thing start messing up. And um, it was a mess that day. But in the video and I think on the board, I actually wrote down Faraday's Law for you. This is what you want to remember, but if you want to do some calculations, what you will have for Faraday's Law is that V induced equals N D phi DT, where this is the voltage induced. Well, let me change this to VL, because you know, a coil is just an inductor, right? So I can write this as VL for now. So it'll be the same as that VL right there. So this is Faraday's law. And the number of turns on the coil, the magnetic flux right here. But this thing taken together, d phi dt or delta phi over delta t, that's the time rate of change of, of flux. You saw in the video where the guy moved the magnet across the coil like this. That's d phi dt. If I move it faster, that's a higher flux per unit time. So you know that the induced voltage was related to the speed that I move the, the magnetic flux across the coil, and that's what this represents. Um, so here is um, something very interesting that is kind of a tangent. It's not really in my lecture, but but if you look at this right here, look at this equation. And let me, I want to erase this. I'll come back to it because I just thought of something I want to show you. Now, look at this equation. This represents Faraday's law. We talked about it. But this equation, if I solve this equation for V, let's solve it for V. What I would get, if I solve it for this V, what I would get is VL equals L DI DT. Very interesting if you think about it. Now, look at these two equations. Look how they are related to each other. I don't know if the book calls it this, but in my mind, this is just another form of Faraday's law. Think about it. Faraday's law says that the voltage induced is directly proportional to the number of turns and directly proportional to the flux or directly proportional to how fast I'm changing the flux. Well, this L right here is directly related to the number of turns. Remember the equation I erased? So this, these two kind of relate to each other. The L, L of what? L of the coil, which has number, a number of turns. And then this DIDT, the, the does it make sure, hopefully that it's crystal clear, that if, if we said that the cause of a magnetic field The cause of a magnetic field is a current flow. He started off talking about magnetism by saying all magnetic fields are created by charging motion, if you remember that. So this is the magnetic flux density, or, or you think of it as a magnetic field, and this is the current that causes it. So if I change the current, I'm going to change the magnetic field. So there's a direct relationship between them. This is flux. If I just had, forget the, forget this. This thing. If I just had that phi right there, that's flux. Just this part right here is flux. Well, where does the flux come from? What creates the flux is that I right there. But now dt here is saying I'm taking I and I'm changing it now. If I change the thing that causes the flux, guess what? I'm going to change the flux. So when I looked at this, I almost fell out of my seat as a young, handsome student sitting at Xavier in the physics department because I was like, man, that's, that's really Faraday's law in disguise. But this makes so much more sense because people don't think in terms of magnetic field. Well, physicists do. But 
We like to think in terms of current and voltage. So look at this. What this is saying is the induced voltage is equal to the inductance, or I should say, the, the, the induced voltage is directly proportional to the inductance of the coil and also directly proportional to, not to the current, but to how fast we change the current. DI DT is how fast we change the current. I can think of it in terms of flux if I want to. The vo voltage induced is, an, is equal to the number of turns around the coil, which is related to the inductance, times how multiplied by how fast we change the flux. So the faster I move that flux across the coil, the bigger DP DT is. Well, here, the induced voltage is equal to L. Now, I don't really talk a lot about L. It's just like a capacitor. Once you get a capacitor and you solder it in the circuit, it's in there. It's a constant now. It's not a variable unless you unsolder and put another one in there. But once you put it in the circuit, you're done. Change it to a constant. Same here. Once you get a coil of so many Henry's, once you have a coil, well, then that's a, that's a constant value. So really, we can just look at the relationship between L and DIDT. Now, here's where this is pretty amazing to me. Here I have a voltage that doesn't, you know that voltage, you know, we all know that V equals I times, let's say, R. If I want more voltage, I can uh, increase the current, right? I get a bigger current across a resistor, I get a bigger voltage drop. Well, here I have a voltage that doesn't depend on that. Here I have a voltage which depends on what? How fast I change the current. Now, I'm in my basement looking at a camera, acting like it's a face on the camera, looking at you. I can't see your expressions. But here, oh, my God, this explains so much. This explains so much. One thing it explains is, uh, well, i got time to go on a tangent. It's just 135. So I'll go on a few tangents, if you will allow me. Think about this. Um, your gasoline engine. Let me get rid of this. Your gasoline engine, um, how does it work? You know, basically, what you have is you have a cylinder. I'll draw it. You have a cylinder. And in the cylinder, you have what they call a piston. So you got a, pin, a piston in here, right? And that piston uh, can go up and down. And it has a, a rod, some kind of rod connected to it, and it can go up and down. Now, what makes it go up and down is over here you got an inlet. You can uh, send in uh, air, and you can send in uh, petrol, and it mixes it together. But then you got to light it, and when you light it, there's a small explosion in there, and that explosion causes the gas to expand, and it pushes the, the piston up. Well, how do you light it? Well, there's something called a spark plug somewhere in here. And if it's a, any of you guys are mechanics, I'm probably botching this up, my artwork. I'm not a mechanic. I'm just a dumb physicist. So I don't really know how this stuff looked. But when I got a, a spark plug, all the spark plug is is basically two electrodes. So here's one electrode, and then you got another electrode right there. Now, this actually has a, like a nut on it, and it screws into your engine block. But there's actually two electrodes. Two electrodes. Now here's the interesting thing. If I have electrodes, uh, let me see. Suppose I have electrodes like this. I got a battery and I got two electrodes, just two wires. And I gotta do this. I'll make the battery variable. Now, no current flow. Let me put an ammeter there just for the heck of it. I'm going to put an ammeter right here. <clears throat> no current is going to flow in the circuit because I have an open circuit over here. But let's say I start to turn the knob up on my power supply, my DC power supply. And let's say that my voltage goes from zero volts up to infinity. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's impossible. That's okay. All I mean is a really high voltage. I start off at a low voltage and nothing happens. I start to turn this up. 
turn my knob, I get make V bigger and bigger and bigger. At some point, I'll start to see a current register on my M meter, even though there's an open circuit here. The reason is that really everything will conduct electricity. Everything conducts electricity. Everything has what we call a breakdown voltage. So you know a insulator doesn't conduct electricity. Well, really it does. It's just that you need a really, really huge voltage to get it to conduct. And if you put a big enough voltage across anything, you can make it conduct. So what I'm telling you is that I can make air conduct electricity if I put a big enough voltage in there. So if I turn this up high enough, you will see the meter register, and then you will see a little arc over here. Electricity actually flow through the air, and it will look like a bunch of sparks. The interesting thing is, is this gap right here. That gap between my electrodes, that gap, let's say my gap was one inch. So from there to there is one inch. It would take 32,000 volts, 32,000 volts of electricity to get current to arc across an inch, one inch. That's a lot of voltage. So look at my spark plug. The way we ignite the gas in the uh, cylinder here is there's a spark plug in there with, with two electrodes in there. Now, I don't know if you ever looked at a spark plug before, but you got these two electrodes, and they're really, really, really close to each other. You might think they're touching, but they're not. You can actually take, like, a piece of paper and put it in between them, and they're not touching. They're really, really, really close to each other. And the reason is is because of this number right here. What you got to do is get this thing to spark because that spark is what ignites the gas fuel mixture to push the, the piston up. So in a car, you only got 12 volts. So even, even making these electrodes really close to each other to where they almost, touch, they almost touch their paper thin, 12 volts ain't enough, is not enough to get it to arc. So how do I, how do I uh, get the voltage, how do I increase the voltage to a high enough level to where it can arc across with the gap of the electrodes? Well, here it is right here. I change the current faster, I get a higher voltage. So in the new cars, it's done electronically, but in the old cars, they actually had a switch. They would turn off and on real fast, and the faster they, they were, they were breaker points. I call them a switch. But it would break and make contact really fast. It would change the current really fast, which generated a voltage big enough to, to arc across the, uh, the gap of a spark plug. And here you're talking probably, I don't know, probably 1,000 volts or more. Now, if you don't believe me, just go out to your car, start it up, grab a spark plug wire, and then touch. No, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. If you, some of you have done that by mistake, and you know what happened. So I don't want you to, to go and say, Professor Singleton said, grab a spark plug wire and touch the metal in the car and see what happens. And then you don't do that. But if you ever done it by mistake, you know, it, it smarts. It hurts because you have a high voltage there. You can actually get shocked, electrocuted if you do that because there's a high, volt, high voltage, low current. In that, but where does the high voltage come from? Is my point when you only have 12 volts. Well, they open and close the switch real fast. We can get as much voltage as you want. Same with a police stun gun. How does that work? I actually had a uh, stun gun. Uh, it, it took a nine volt DC battery and produced 10,000 volts on the output of it. And it was about the size of a pack of cigarettes, looked like a little box. And it had two electrodes right there. And, you know, you put in a 9-volt battery and you get out, like, a couple thousand volts. I think it was 10,000. 10,000 volts, I think, would, but this a very, very low current. So so it would uh, you know, immobilize a person. But, again, how do you go from 9 volts to, let's say, 10,000? Just change the current quickly. And there's, there's really easy ways, devices, if when you take electronics, you'll study something called a, a 555 uh, timer a multi-vibrator, and you can use that to change current a million times per second if you want. Imagine if you put a million in here, the kind of voltage you can generate. So this equation, to me, is exciting and important. It's just another spin on Faraday's law, although your book might not call it that. Well, anyway, uh, I think it's enough of that. I didn't mean to go into all of that, but this has so many applications, it's ridiculous. 
So I'm not going to actually have you do much with this. Uh, I would remember this formula right here. I know some of you have signed up to take me for AC. And in AC, what I do is the video that well, I couldn't get it to play, but that you guys watch, I start on day one with that video. And then we go in and we talk about, well, what is AC? What's DC? Why do we need AC and DC? And we use some of this bait, this, these first principles to explain all of that, and you'll be very satisfied with what you learn, I think. And this it starts with this stuff. So this is some important stuff right here. I, I love it. But uh, anyway, let's get back into uh, inductors a little bit more, how we're going to use it in this class. Now, remember we have capacitors in series and capacitors in parallel. It's, it was kind of confusing a little bit because we said capacitors in series behave like resistors in parallel and vice versa. I should say vice versa. I should say capacitors in series behave like uh, resistors in parallel and capacitors in parallel act like resistors in series. So you should know what that means by now. You don't have to worry about all that with inductors because with inductors, they behave just like resistors. Let me show you what I'm saying. Actually, if you got the handout, if you printed the handout out, take that out because there's some practice problems on the handout. But if you didn't, don't worry about it. I'll put it on the board because I put it up at the last minute, and you guys probably didn't have time to put it out. But I got the paper right here, and uh, one of the – I'm looking at problem number. There's just three, three practice problems on here. And one of them, uh, I guess we can do all three. Um, the first one says, calculate the inductance of a coil that induces 100 volts when its current changes by 5 milliamps in 10 microseconds. Let me put that on the board. So if you got this sheet, if you did print it out, take it out. If you didn't, don't, don't worry about it. I'm just reading number one on it, and then you'll have it in your notes. And when you do print it out, just go back and look at it. So these are some practice problems that I would give you. Um, so it says calculate the inductance. So we're looking for L. Calculate the inductance of a coil that induces 100 volts. So VL, the induced voltage, is 100 volts. So we want to know the inductance of a coil if I have uh, induced voltage of 100 volts and the current changes, so current change is delta I over delta T. The current changes by uh, 5 milliamps in 10 microseconds. So it goes from 0 to 5 and 0 to 10. Right, so delta I over delta T. Now, I would write that like di dt. So either way you want to do it is all right. So if I go back to my equation then, my equation was uh, L is equal to VL over di dt. So I just, let's just plug it in and it works. Got 100 volts. I don't have a calculator, so... Let me see how many people, how many people are even out there? Are you guys out here? I don't see a lot of people out there. Seven. Kevin, you're yeah. always here. I should give you guys, I should give you guys extra credit just for showing up. I wish I had started taking attendance. I would give you credit. Let's see. Uh, Branson is there. Dominique is there. Ethan, Jacob, Kevin, Melissa, uh, Steve. Why is oh, Steve's there. And Tristan. Okay. And Rodri left. It looks like Steve left and re-signed in, I guess. Uh, anyway, um, so I got 100 volts. So be careful when you put this in. Is the IDT. <laughs> I like to use standard units. I'm not going to do the milliamp, but put it in at amps per second. Always go back to your standard unit. You make less mistakes. So 5 milliamps is 5 times 10 to the third with a minus amps over 10 microseconds is 10 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. I know this by units on the bottom, 
I write it a little differently. My units, there's my number, but that's amps per second, which is what I want. So on your get your calculator out. Somebody for me, find this ratio right here, but divide 100 divided by open paren, 5 times 10 to the minus third, divided by again, 10 times 10 to the minus 6. Close paren equals, and tell me what you get. Tenths. How much? You said two tenths? Yes. Two over ten? Zero point two, yeah. That? Yeah. Okay, so zero point two. The units would be Henry's. Henry's, or maybe sometimes you'll see it millihenries. So I can write it as 200 millihenries if I want. Now, nobody calculates inductance this way. I mean, but, but you can see, you know, if you wanted to show how smart you were, you could do it. To me, the power in this equation is when you wrote the way I showed you before, VL. You can get as big as a VL as you want by simply changing the current. Now, I go into this a lot in AC because this, oh, my God, there's so much you can do with this stuff. And I know uh, Jacob, well, no, Jacob, you're more in the room. If you're into the engineering of this, um, there's just so much you can do with this magnetism and, and all this stuff. It's just, if you're in the applications, this is where this stuff is really cool. You can't do much with DC, but you got to start somewhere, right? But once you get DC under your belt, you learn the basic principles. AC is like the other side of the, other side of the house. Is it, you got you to gotta know AC, you got to know DC. Once you get that, that's your foundation. Now we study devices. What, what device, now once you get the devices, that's when you can start putting stuff together like a cell phone. You won't build a cell phone, but a simple device, you can put it together and actually understand how it works. More importantly, you can have an idea and come up with a design and then you can build something that you just that you just created in your mind. That's the amazing part of this. But you gotta get AC and DC under your belt. And um, well, let me stop because I can go on about that. Um, let me see. So we got this, this is pretty simple. So on the final exam, some people want to know, the final exam is not over the whole semester. It's over from where exam three, where that left off, till where we end. And we're talking about what magnetism, we're talking about uh, capacitors, and then we're talking about inductors. So there's not a whole lot there. Uh, so this, I'll probably give you something like this, which is simple. Okay, now on the other one, on the sheet, on the capacitor, uh, what I was really wanting to point out, it says you got three uh, inductors. I said capacitor, I'm an inductor. You got three inductors. Let me put them on the board. Three inductors. So the way you do that is like resistors R1, R3. Here are L1, L2, L3. And L1 is uh, 20. L2 is 40, and L3 is 60, and those are millihenries, millihenries, millihenries. So you got those three inductors, those three coils, and it says they're hooked up in series. Assume no mutual inductance. You can read about mutual inductance if you want in the book. It's in the book. They call it L sub M, and it's calculated K times the square root of L1. L I don't care about mutual inductance. I'll talk a little bit about it in AC, but if you want to read about it, you can. I'm not going to ask anything about mutual inductance. Um, if they're in series, what would you do? How would you find LT? And the answer is you just add them up, just like resistors. However resistors are, whatever formula we use for resistors in series, it's the same with inductors. <clears throat> you just change the R to an L. So here I would add up this and this and this, this and that. So my LT for this would be 120 millihenries. So write down in your notes that when you're trying to find the total inductance, it behaves just like resistors. And then they say, all right, well, what we got them when they're connected in parallel? Again, assume no mutual inductance. So now we got them connected in parallel. So I got my three coils. I guess I'll draw them this time. 
those look like light bulbs. So I got 20, I got 40, I got 60, and these are all millihenries. So now if I had three coils in parallel, whatever formula you would use for uh, resistors in parallel, change the R's to L, and you got it. Now, uh, if I only had two, I would use product of the sum. But I'm going to use 1 over LT equals 1 over L1. But L1 is 20 millihenries plus 1 over L2. But L2 is 40 millihenries plus 1 over L3. But L3 is 60 millihenries. Now, somebody said, why don't you write it like uh, LT equals 1 over 1 over L1. But you can do it that way. That's the way you would solve it. But the way I showed you to do it on your calculator, using the reciprocal key, it's just easy to put it in this way. But knowing that you're doing it that way, if you hit that reciprocal key, you don't even have to think about that formula. So hit, you know, your reciprocal key, hit 20, uh, what you call reciproc reciprocate. It's called reciprocate. I don't know if reciprocate is a word, but I like it. So 20 reciprocate plus 40 reciprocate plus 60 reciprocate equals, that's not your answer, that's 1 over LT. Then you got to reciprocate that one more time, and that'll give you LT of what? Ten point nine. Ten point nine, and these are all in millihenries. Now notice that, like resistors, my if these are resistors, my total resistance must be smaller than the smallest branch resistance. Well, inductors are the same way. My total inductance has to be smaller than the smallest one, which was twenty. So I didn't calculate it, but I'll take your word for it that ten point nine is is right. So these are simple. I mean, it's nothing to write home to mom about here. All right, so now let's move on <clears throat> to something else here with inductors. Remember those transient times? With a capacitor, let's compare. Well, let's review. With a capacitor, there were three important times we looked at. The times And then the action. One time was T equals zero. When T equals zero for a capacitor. It's the instance we close the switch. And at that time, the capacitor is going to, the action is going to act like a short circuit. So you get this equivalent to a short circuit. At T greater than or equal to five tau. T greater than or equal to 5 tau, where tau is the time constant, R, R by C, then the capacitor is going to, it's going to act like an open circuit. In between these two times, the T in between here and there, that T is called the transient time. And I mentioned to you that the transient time means that things are changing. The voltage across the capacitor is changing. The voltage across the resistor is changing. The current in the circuit is changing. Everything is all complicated. So these two times were special times. Well, this is for a capacitor. What does that look like for an inductor? The action for a conductor. Well, believe it or not, at t equals zero, if I have this circuit, I got my switch and I got my inductor. At t equals zero, the inductor acts like an open circuit. At t, now the time constant for a capacitor is R times C. That's how you get tau. The tau for an inductor is different. We'll talk about that. It's not. It's, it's it's a little different. I'll give that to you. But it's still five tau. And so for this circuit, this is going to behave like an 
or short circuit. So look at this. They're opposite each other. At t equals zero, the capacitors are short and the ductors are open. Uh, at five tau, the capacitors are open and the ductors are short. We went through and explained this. We went through and looked at a capacitor charging up, and we said that t equals zero, there, there, there isn't any charge on the plate of the capacitor yet. Current is just starting to flow in the circuit. Even though we think a current is being instantaneous, it actually take, takes a small time for that current to start to, to deposit charge on the plate. And the more we start to deposit charge on the plate, the harder it is for the future charge to get on the plate because light charges repel. We looked at this in some detail. So I see how at t equals zero, capacitors are short. And I can even see how when that capacitor is fully charged up, if I have a simple series RC circuit, when it's fully charged up, when the capacitor voltage, if I have a resistor, when the capacitor voltage on this side equals the supply voltage on this side, when those two voltages are equal, the voltage drop across the resistor is zero, there can be no current flow. So I can see how when a capacitor is fully charged, I can see how it acts like an open. But how in the heck does this work? Why is it that at t equals zero, this thing acts like an open? No current can flow. And after five time constants, it acts like a short. Let's look at that. Now, remember I told you how important Faraday's law is? I said we're going to keep coming back to it, especially in AC. Well, that's what we're about to do. Remember Faraday. Faraday says if I have a coil, that's an inductor. If I have a magnetic field, and if there's motion or movement, then I can induce a voltage across the coil. Let's take a close look at this circuit. All right. Now, just like with the capacitor, as soon as I close that switch, that's T equals zero. And we're saying that T equals zero, this thing is going to act like an open, which is the opposite of the capacitor. So why would it act like an open when I close that switch? Well, here's what I want you to think about. Well, before I do that, we kind of been lying to you a little bit. I've been lying. I'm going to, I got to, I got to fess up now. I've been lying to you guys. I've been telling a little bitty lie. Uh, I told you DC looks like this. So let's say this is time. This could be either uh, voltage or well, we'll make it current because I'm going to talk about current. And you know DC current looks like this. And basically it goes on forever, right? This goes forever. So that's DC. AC is more complicated, as you see. But this is what we've been showing. Now, we had a V there. Most of the time we talk about DC voltage. No matter, voltage, current, same thing, right? Uh, it's all constant is the point. What's the lie I've been telling you? What's wrong with the picture I just drew? What's wrong with the picture? How does it get to the value to begin with? Exactly. Now, this is what I want to say. Ooh, I, I got to watch because I get in trouble. I said the wrong thing, but I get excited when you when you use first principles and you figure this out. So let me rephrase the question. When you say, how does it get to the value? How does it go from here to here instantaneously? How? Well, the answer is it doesn't. It's impossible. You can't go from zero to some value in no time unless you're God. That's not possible. What we really mean is this. Why don't we draw the graph like that then if that's what we mean? Well, the reason we don't is because normally, see if I do this, 
I'll put a little thing right here. And then from here, this little piece of, that's time on this axis. So I'm going to call that delta T. That little delta T is so small, like when you close the switch, it's so small you can ignore it. It's like having a million dollars in your left pocket and two cents in your right pocket. You don't go around saying, hey, I got a million dollars and two cents. You ignore the two cents. That's, this is two cents. But if all you had was a nickel, you had five pennies, and you lost the two cents, you'd be mad. Now the two cents matter. So the point I'm making is most of the time, we can ignore this rise time for the current in DC. When you close the switch, it takes time for that current to go from here to here to build up. And most of the time, 99 times out of 100, you don't care about that because it's so small. But sometimes it matters. Sometimes that matters. And this is the time where it matters because look what happens. If I close the switch here, if I close that switch, the current's going to build up real fast. So now remember, that's, that's not current. It's really D dt, right? Or delta, I said dt, I mean di dt. Change in I over change in t, right? But remember what we said earlier. We said earlier that the induced voltage, vL, is directly related to L times di dt. So the bigger this is, the change the bigger the voltage. This happens really, really fast. So here's what happens. You close this switch. When that switch is closed, you have everything Faraday says you need to induce a, to induce a voltage. You have a, do I have a coil? Yep, check. That's the induct. Do I have a magnetic field? Well, if I close that switch and I got current flowing, guess what I got? I got a magnetic field. The question is, is the magnetic field changing? How do I get the motion? That's where we get the motion. So here's what happens. You close this switch, current starts to flow in the circuit, right? As soon as current starts to flow, right away it builds up a magnetic field. But as that magnetic field is building up, because that current is ramping up, I said ramp, that current is ramping up. I can't say that. Let me say it slowly. The current is ramping up. The magnetic field is doing this. That causes a voltage across the inductor. I want to call it VL to exist. And that voltage is enough to oppose VT. Now, I use the term EMF in class second third week of semester. I forget when. Uh, e M F. If you remember, some of you know it stands for electromotive force. So this right here, the voltage is a source of E M F. Sometimes they'll use a capital E or a lowercase e for voltage instead of a V because E M F and voltage are not exactly the same, but you can think about among friends they're the same thing. So the more voltage, the more E M F, right? Well, guess what? This over here is called a C EMF, and the C is for counter, a counter EMF. So what I'm telling you is if you have an inductor and you close the switch, at the instance you close the switch, there's a build up, a quick buildup of magnetic field, which, which causes a counter voltage enough to oppose the actual voltage source so it looks like an open circuit. No, no current can flow because the the actual EMF or the actual voltage and the counter EMF are bucking up against each other. And it's like kind of like a tug of war and nothing's moving. So the instant you close the switch, you create that counter EMF. But then when you reach the top here, you still got current flowing. So you still got the coil. You still got the magnetic field. But when you level off here, what you don't have is motion. So what's going to happen? Well, that counter EMF is going to die down, and as it dies down, current is going to start to flow, and when that counter EMF reaches zero, this is just another piece of wire. It's a short circuit. So hopefully in your mind's eye, you can see that. 
that at t equals zero, Faraday's law is going to the counter EMF is going to stop the current from flowing, and then as that current ramps up and then the magnetic field dies down, it allows the current to go through because the, the counter EMF dies away. They say there's a duality between capacitors and inductors. Example, what I mean by that is whatever's true for one is the opposite is true for the other. So here's one example. A capacitor at T0 is a short, an inductor at T0 is an open. A capacitor at 5 tau is an open, an inductor at 5 tau is a short. And so, again, these have applications out of just so many is ridiculous. Knowing, you won't remember the equations. You got to, five years from now, you have to, I know we said something about that. You'll look it up in the book. But the way these things behave, when you want to design something, that's what you got to remember. If there's a reason to, to cause this action, the inductors do your choice. That's what you want to use to, to do this. If you're designing something, you got to remember how this stuff works, these first principles. Okay, so knowing that, knowing that for a inductor, T0, it's an open, uh, five tau is a short. Let's play the same game we did with the passes. I'm going to give you a circuit, and I want you to calculate in the circuit the voltage across each resistor and the current to each resistor at two times, at 5 tau and at T equals zero. So, again, this is on blackboard, this diagram. I have put it on blackboard, but I'm going to draw it for you so you don't have to worry about it. So here's the circuit. I got a, a battery. Sixty volts. I got a resistor and another resistor. Now you got to be careful and draw your resistor because sometimes you draw your coil and resistor they kind of look like each other. So you got to draw like my coil. I'm going to try to make it more round like that. And I got another resistor and I got another coil. All right, and then uh, this is R1, 15, R2, 30. This is L1, uh, this is R3, 30, and this is L2. Notice it's like in the capacitor circuit. I don't really care what the values for L1. At T0 and 5, five times, you don't really care what the values are. We only care what the equivalent to. So according to my clock on the wall, when I look away from the camera that way, I'm looking at the clock on the wall. When I look over that way, I'm looking at you guys on the computer, but you don't ever put your pictures up there for me to look at. And then I got to remember, hey, I'm talking to the camera right there, so now I'm looking at you. So I'm looking at the clock on the wall now. It's 12, 12. I'm going to give you a few seconds. I want to know the voltage of each resistor at T0, and I want to know the current of each resistor at T0. And I want to finish this problem. So that means we got to move quickly because it's 12-12. So go ahead and you do what you think you need to do to tell me the voltage across each resistor and the current through each resistor at T0. So at T0, the inductors are shorts, equivalent to a, that's not right. At T0, the inductors are opens. They're equivalent to an open. So let's look at what happens when I open up the circuit. Well, let's start with L2. When I open this up, nothing happens. Doesn't affect anything. But what about when I open this up? When I open this up, 
That's going to stop the current from flowing to R3. So V3 is 0, I3 is 0. And the only resistors with current and uh, voltage would be R1 and R2. Let me make sure I got my circuit right. Yep. Um, and so we got to figure out what that is. Well, we can use Bose divider rule, I guess, to get the voltages. <coughs> um, let's do R2, I guess. So V2 is going to be my total voltage, which is 60 volts times uh, R2, which is uh, 30 over this total right here, which is 45. Somebody do the math for me. What's that? Uh, I should be able to multiply it out, but I don't feel like thinking right now. 39.99. So let's say 40 volts. Yep. So 40 volts. And if that's 40, that's got to be 20 volts. Okay, well, that wasn't too bad. Now, what about at 5 tau when... The when the inductors are fully, we say charged, but it doesn't really make sense to say charged. But after five time constant, the voltage, the counter EMF has went away, and the current is at a max. Oh, by the way, while I'm thinking about it, uh, next time, I, I don't know, we'll, with the video that I make next, we need to talk about, we're going to talk about transients just a little bit. I'm not going to go into the calculation, but we'll talk a little bit more about behavior. But, uh, man, well, something I want you to remind me of. I just forgot what it was. I I'll think about it. So everybody sees how this, how this works. Now, let's do five. Oh, I want to talk about the, the time constant and all of that. What I wanted to say was the graph, that universal time chart. I, I want to say a little bit more about that in the next lecture. So then, we'll, then that'll be it for the semester. So let's change this to five tiles. And then five tile, I had an inductor here and I had an inductor here. As you know, at five tile, we got to replace those inductors with the short. So L1, when I short that out, well, that doesn't really do anything. It just connects this node and that node. It just makes it one big node. But that doesn't do anything. But look at L2. What is L2? What will that do to the circuit? It's out of I put a short right. What did you say, Kevin? It's just a line. It's a, out of the circuit. There's no nothing going through it. Exactly. So this short, anything, in, remember, anything in parallel to short is out of the circuit. I think that's what Kevin meant. So R3 is in parallel with it. So guess what? It's shorted out. I have 30 in, or whatever it was in parallel with zero, it's shorted out. But since this is a short and this is a short now, look at that resistor. Guess what? It too is shorted out. So that's shorted out. The only resistor in the circuit at five time constants is R1. And so all those re resistors I just erased, those voltage drops are zero. The current to each of those is zero. The only resistor with a voltage drop and the current would be R1. And so the voltage across R1 would be the 60. And the current through it would be uh, 60 divided by 15, 4. And that's all there are to it. Does that make sense? So these are, this is some, uh, you know, when I learned this stuff, uh, we were just, I was doing all this. I didn't really look ahead at what was coming. And I knew I wanted to learn electronics. I'm thinking, well, this DC stuff is cool, but what can you do with it? And we calculated power, and that was kind of nice because I see watts on, like, a speaker or something and learning how to hook up stuff in series and parallel. That was cool, but you don't really do much with resistors. I was installing speakers and audio systems, so I knew if I had two 16-ohm speakers and I put them in parallel, I got 8 ohms, and that was cool. But eventually things kind of run out, what you can do with DC. But then it comes along AC, and when you take AC, DC is like – watching half of a movie. You don't really know the full, and you got to have DC and AC together as your foundation. But once you get those under your belt and you start looking at devices, oh my God, it's just, 
this stuff is pretty amazing how you can put it together to get things that you want to make things that you want to happen in a certain way. This is some pretty cool stuff, and um, hopefully, uh, um, so uh, let me say a little bit more. So I had a thought. What I was going to do since I got according to my clock, I got two minutes. I was thinking about the final exam, and at first I was leaning towards, you know what I'll do? I'll just give a one-hour final or hour 20-minute final on live on the Internet. So what will happen is I would have the final, and uh, I would load it on Blackboard at, at uh, 1 o'clock, and then you would have to upload it to me at, at 2.20. And then I'm thinking, well, number one, I don't know how you guys are uploading and doing this, but I always get somebody that either they, they can't up, there's always some kind of issue, which is why I want you guys to do an exam pretty early, because there's always some kind of issue. You got to expect a technology issue, or you may not have a scanner that just got away. And by the way, um, just for future reference, somebody was saying that you can't draw on a, on a, on a Word doc. Uh, if you want to make a circuit, you, can, you guys have access to multi -sim. You can build the circuit in multi-sim, and you can just drag over the circuit. And you can copy paste from multi-sim to Word. I probably should have told you that, but since face to face, I didn't really get the chance to. I don't teach multi-sim until I teach digital, so I didn't really get a chance to bring it up. But if you ever want to make a circuit, build it in multi-sim. Since you now are multi-sim experts, build it in multi-sim, drag over the you know drag over the the drawing and paste it in the Word, and then you can have your work shown without drawing into the word document if you don't have a way to print but but anyway uh so i was thinking about the exam giving it that just giving it live and that way it can be done with but then i got to thinking well you know maybe what i'll do is because uh, i, I want to say a little bit more about this i want to talk about, i want to close the course and the only thing we got to talk about is the uh, inductor transients and if you looked at i don't know if you had a chance to look at it but it's not even a calculation. I just kind of show you how inductors behave in the transient uh, time period. So I just there's no calculation on this document, which is on Blackboard right now. Uh, but I, I don't think I want to do that. Probably what I'll do is just, even though the semester ends on Monday, it ends that Monday, I'll probably, uh, thinking what I'll do is I'll put the final up either Friday or over the weekend, and give you, I, I think I got to have my grades in. I want to say Wednesday of next week. But I'll probably like, you know, I'll let you know more before the time comes. But probably I'm thinking like Friday, putting it up, and then making it do on Sunday night. And that way we can get it done. I'm thinking about that. As opposed to having you guys do it live and submit it at the end of a lecture. I, I, I just think it would be better for you guys. That way you can have all the material there. And you'll have time on your side if I do it that way. Okay, so I'm thinking that's what I'll do. So I'm saying that to say um, we'll come back to this because I do want to talk about that universal time chart. If you looked at that time chart, you know that there was quantities on there with a C. And I mentioned that's capacitor stuff, V, C, I, C. But then there was quantities on there with an L. Well, you now know what L means. Anything on that chart with the L was an inductor. So I want to maybe I'll put it, put that up on the screen and we can talk about that a little bit. So two things. Next time I'm not going to calculate, but I'm going to do talk about how the inductor behaves during the transient time. I already talked about T0 and 5 tau, so the transient time, and then I want to talk about the values on that universal time chart. And then I want I'll take any questions you have from me for the whole semester, anything you want to ask or whatever, and then we'll close the course. And then as long as you don't sign up for when I teach AC, I try not to teach digital, the way they keep giving it to me. I like AC and DC and physics. So as long as you don't take me for AC, then I'll never darken your, uh, I know it's probably some singleton haters out there. So I never have to darken your doorstep again. You'll be done with me, just kick me to the curb, and you're good to go. But if you take AC, uh, most of the time I'm the one that teaches AC. Every once in a while they'll give it to Russ, but most of the time it's me. So we'll see. Um, I think that's all. Anybody have any comments or questions before we close? I want to do one more lab, and I know I've been saying that. Each video I say that and I never put it up. Uh, I want to do one final lab.
So I will put that up and look for it. Uh, I got to remember the last one you did. I'm thinking, I, I kind of want to do the feminine, but I don't know how well that's going to go in multi sim without me there that, where you guys can ask questions. So um, the series parallel lab is probably, it'll probably be the one if I made a copy of that. So uh, look for something on Wednesday, and then we will meet on Friday. On Friday, I'll talk about you know the curve and finish up this lecture, have a little bit more to say about the final jam, and then that's all she wrote, and we'll be done with the semester. And hopefully you guys are doing okay. So I'm done. Does anybody have any more questions or comments? Let me turn the recorder off. And if you want to ask me anything, because this goes on YouTube.